Well, uh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here with you. And uh, it is interesting. You have brought the Open Ed Conference here. We were joking about that last night. If, uh, if the big five publishers dropped a bomb on this meeting, they could really do some serious damage to the movement, because most of us are here. Uh, <laughs> So, um, I've, changed the, uh, I've changed the title because I wanted to be a little provocative um, in talking about this topic. And I want to say uh, first right off the bat, as Cable did last night, this presentation of course is open as well. It's currently on SlideShare. If you go to slideshare.net slash open content, you can download it and play along with the home version of the presentation while I go. So I want to talk about kind of first principles and build up from there. Um, and I want to make the argument that education is sharing. And I want to persuade you that this is true. Um, when I say education is sharing, I mean it's sharing what you know with your students. It's sharing feedback with your students as they submit work to you, which is their way of sharing with you what they know. It's sharing encouragement with them, hopefully not just criticism, but giving them some hope, some dream that they can be successful in what they're working on. It's sharing your passion for your discipline, which I hope you do. And when we do it really well, <coughs> when we do it the best, education is about sharing some of yourself with your students. And if you think back to great teachers who've really impacted your life, it was those who shared something of themselves. When I say that education's about sharing, I don't mean that it's faculty meetings are about sharing. Um, I don't mean that the tenure and promotion process is about sharing. Heaven knows that's a terrific waste of time. And it's certainly not about, you know, fighting for parking. Now I say I say TNP is a big waste of time as somebody who is a a faculty member for 15 years and got TMP the first time I went up for it. I just, you know, I could have written another four articles in the time I wasted trying to demonstrate how productive I was during that process. Um, you know, it's not about fighting for parking. That's not uh, sharing. I mean the educative acts themselves. The reason we all signed up for the work. That is all about sharing. And I'll go so far as to say that if there's no sharing, going on. There might be a lot of noise and a lot of sound and a lot of flashing lights, but if there's no sharing, there is no education happening. There's just no way that you can educate without sharing what you know, without sharing your feedback, without sharing some encouragement. Period. Sharing is, um, sharing can be hard sometimes. If I share my fries with you, then there are fewer fries for me to eat, so that makes it hard for me to want to share. We heard from a real economist yesterday, I'll pretend to be one for just a moment, and say that you know, economists classify things as rivalrous or non-rivalrous. Rivalrous resources are resources that when you use one or when you consume one, it precludes me or excludes me from being able to do it. So if you eat my french fries, I can't eat them. Uh, sharing french fries can be hard. Sharing a toothbrush can be hard. Uh, you know, but just to take uh, maybe a co more common example, if you eat my slice of pie, I can't eat my slice of pie. But the non-rivalrous, the flip side of that is if you make a recipe, if you make pumpkin pie from this recipe, it doesn't preclude me from making pumpkin pie from this recipe. The recipe can be used by all of us simultaneously. The recipe is non-rivalrous. And probably the best example, at least in, in our literature in the US, of somebody talking about this idea of things being non-rivalrous is Jefferson. Right. Uh, Jefferson, I'm not going to violate the first rule of PowerPoint and read it to you. I'll pause for a moment while you read it for yourself. But, uh, you know, the, the taper here is a candle. And I can light your candle with my candle without having to put my flame out the same way that I can share ideas with you without having to forget them in order to communicate them to you. Right? If, if knowledge, if ideas were rivalrous, it would be be a pretty scary situation. And when you think about what we share in education when we're talking about the actual content, um, you know, in education we share data, we share models, we share equations, we share definitions. The types of things that we tend to share in education are non-rivalrous. Um, 
you know, again, if, if they weren't, then a teacher would be like a honeybee who, once he put a stinger in you, he was done. You know, you'd have, you could teach somebody one time, but you'd have to forget everything that you knew in order to teach it, and you would you'd be finished. Fortunately, it doesn't work that way. But what if we want to share with each other when we're not face to face? What if we want to share asynchronously? How do we do that? Um, you know, we're recording this. Uh, we've been recording the keynote sessions at this at this meeting. If we want to share asynchronously, typically we have to take those ideas that we know that we want to share with someone else after we're gone and we have to externalize them from ourselves somehow. And that externalization process <laughs> it used to be somebody sitting down with a pen and a sheet of paper and writing it out and just writing and writing and spending their whole life locked in a closet writing. And then we had some innovations around metallic movable type and around the press that made this quicker to do, but what you'll notice is that when we externalize ideas, that magic quality that ideas have of being non-rivalrous kind of collapses and the externalized ideas become rivalrous. So if I capture what I know in a book and leave it so that you can interact with it when I'm not around, <coughs> now it's not a rivalrous good anymore. Now that book's off the shelf and Lauren's reading it, nobody else can look at it. So. I've always wanted to use a Lego steampunk time machine in a presentation. I finally have an <laughs> excuse to do that now. What if there was a magical machine that could take our externalized ideas and convert them from being rivalrous to being non-rivalrous? Um, of course, that kind of machine does exist, and uh, we call it the internet. When you take ideas, which normally you have to compete for access to when they're externalized. You have to wait across the table as your significant other finishes the newspaper in the morning. If you take that same news and instead put it on the internet, a million people can all read it at the same time. They don't have to wait for their neighbor to finish with the comics. Uh, these externalized ideas gain the magical quality when you put them online of being non-rivalrous. So while I was on Wikipedia downloading this information about the Nash Equilibrium yesterday, there were, I'm sure, other people looking at it at the same time. We weren't competing for access to that. So you know, this provides us this idea that we can externalize our ideas in a form that's non-rivalrous. This gives us an unprecedented capacity for sharing. And as, in as much as education is sharing, that means we have an unprecedented capacity to educate in this context, except that we can't. Because long, long before the internet was even a gleam in an engineer's eye, there is something called copyright. Uh, you know, Cable presented some of this last night. Um, but, you know, but when you think about the four things that copyright regulates, right, some of the, two of those four things are making and distributing copies, and Cable showed some of these numbers last night. Um, basically, copy and distribute are free in the context of the internet. That's why we would argue that digital goods are non-rivalrous. But it does put us in this situation where everything that the technology enables us to do that's interesting, this idea that copy has become free, that distribution has become free, everything the technology enables us to do, the law prohibits us from doing. For example, digital file sharing of music and of videos and things like that, where copies, perfect copies, can be made instantly and for free and distributed in the same way. Of course, the law forbids us from doing that and has from a time long before when the internet came into existence. It's, it's like, imagine you invented an airplane. You invented the airplane. But a few years before you invented the airplane, there was a law that was passed that said all transportation must happen on roadways. So you invented an airplane, but all you can do with it is drive it on the highway. Because the law says all transportation must happen on roadways. So how do we get this sucker in the air, right? I mean, it's an incredible waste of time to drive an airplane down the highway. The way we get it in the air is with open what I want to spend a few minutes talking about now, particularly open educational resources. And Cable did some definitional work around this last night. I'll take just a slightly separate uh, cut at it. 
And when we say educational resources, everybody knows what we mean by educational resources. They're textbooks, they're syllabi, they're videos, they're exams. But when we say open educational resources, what is it specifically that we mean? We mean two things, and you heard these again from Cable last night. Free and unfettered access. So not only do I not have to pay, but I don't have to give up a zip code or give up an email address or somehow penetrate a wall that you've put between me and the content. Free and unfettered access and, importantly, a set of copyright permissions that we call the five R's. So let me just, just to make this point, just to beat you over the head with it if you'll forgive me, free is not open. Open is free plus permissions. The entire internet is free. The entire internet is free in a look but don't touch kind of way, right? CNN.com is free to read. The New York Times, to some degree, is free to read. National Geographic is free to read. But do you have copyright permissions in those? No. You can't do anything to them. You can, you're like a kid at your grandma's house with all the porcelain things on the shelf, right? You can look, but you can't touch. The whole internet is free. It's kind of uninteresting. Open is free plus permissions, particularly these permissions, the permissions we call the five R's. Retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. You know, first, and in some ways most importantly, with an open educational resource, I have permission to make a copy of it and to own that copy. Not a copy that's locked up behind some digital rights management that uh, prevent me from printing it, that put a time bomb inside it, as Cable said last night, that makes it blow up after 180 days where I lose access to it. We're, we're talking about just good old-fashioned ownership where I can get a copy and I can hold on to it forever. It's becoming increasingly difficult in a world of Netflix and Hulu and Spotify and people that want you to stream things but never want to let you own anything. They want you to be hooked on the subscription service. They want to be paid every month. Ownership is something we will be hearing more and more about. The five R's give you permission to make your own copy and keep it, to use it in a range of ways, to localize, improve, adapt, change the material, maybe to take two or more things and put them together in what the kids would call a mashup, uh, to, to remix things together. And then whether we're talking about the verbatim copy that you made or your improved copy or the mashup that you created, the ability to give that away to others for free. When we're talking about open educational resources, we mean all five of these permissions. And if you don't have these permissions, then what you are talking about might be free, but is not open. Open is free plus permissions. And those permissions, uh, and I won't hit this too hard because Cable did a great job of it last night, those permissions are usually expressed by Creative Commons licenses. So when you think about an open educational resource and the set of five permissions that you have, everything that the internet makes us technically capable of doing, open educational resources give us the legal permission to do. Okay, and this is, this is a key point. You know, so that when you're thinking about your textbook adoption choice for the term, the choice to use traditionally copyrighted materials is a choice to drive the airplane down the road. It's the choice that says, I'm gonna keep living in this world of this old law that is out of sync with the modern capability that's available to me. The choice to use openly licensed materials is a choice to get that thing in the air and do, do more interesting things than you could before. So open educational resources, it's not about the cost. I mean, the cost is great, but as I said, the entire internet is free, essentially. It's sort of uninteresting. It's not about the cost, it's about enabling innovation. It's about giving you permission to experiment, to change, to adapt, improve, to mash up. And at the end of the day, it's about improving student learning. That's what all of us care the most about. Um, you know, we said that copy and distribute are free in this context. It's not just about copy and distribute, of course, because revise, remix falls outside of that. And revise, remix, again, are about adapting and improving and granting you local control, which you know, makes me think that maybe we need to actually revisit this classification between rivalrous and non-rivalrous. Um, 
You know, Stephen Weber suggested this term anti-rivalrous. And what did he mean by that? Uh, you know, he meant that when you're open, when you share things and give them away in this openly licensed set of, uh, set of circumstances, not only after you give things away do you still have what you gave away, but actually more comes back to you because you gave it away. Somebody took your uh, open textbook and added another chapter to it. They created some videos for it. They did something that provided additional value back to you that you would not have received if you hadn't shared. You know, when you give stuff away, if they're french fries, then you have fewer of them. When you give things away, if they're ideas, maybe you still have the same amount of them. But when you give things away that you've openly licensed and given people permission to do stuff with, they do cool stuff with it, and they openly license it, and then you have more than you had before you share. So let me say a word about Lumen, about, uh, about our organization. You know, Cable made the point last night with a great infographic from a report that Creative Commons recently released that there are currently over 880 million known open educational resources in the world. There's probably more than that. This is just the number that Google knows about. There's almost a billion of these in the world, and yet their uptake in higher ed is just tiny. We're not really using them. And I've been working gee, since 98 directly on this issue of open ed, and I have to say it's a little frustrating. We've succeeded in producing so many of these, but we've had so little success in seeing them adopted, what I would call a displacing adoption, not an adoption of OER as supplemental materials, but adoption of OER in a way that moves the $150 textbook off the syllabus and actually saves students money. And so a couple of years ago, um, uh, some friends of mine and I, particularly Kim Thanos, founded Lumen as an entity that really wants to help get OER adopted. There's plenty of them being built, there's plenty of them being reviewed and rated and every, uh, you know, all these other activities. They're just not used in the classroom as much as they ought to be. How can we get them adopted? How can we get them adopted effectively? That's, that's a problem that we work on. So that, you know, that translates essentially into us providing a wide range of adoption supports. Everything from on-campus faculty training and instructional design, my PhDs in instructional design, educational technology, you know, ongoing technical support and pedagogical support for faculty, hosting, LMS integration, continuous improvement, and research, research support particularly as well. I'm gonna show some research findings in a, in a little bit from a Gates study that we're running currently called National OER Impact Study. But this is really what we do. This is what Lumen is about. It's about helping people actually use open in ways that are effective. And as Cable indicated yesterday, I think a couple people actually nodded toward this, everything that we do is open. All the courses are open. The platform that we've built to host courses and do LMS integration is open. Everything is open. All the content is CC BY. All of the software is under an open source uh, initiative approved license. Um, are we really, if this, if this means something to you, it'll mean a lot. If it doesn't mean anything, it won't mean anything at all. We really want to be a Red Hat for OER, right? Red Hat is a company that provides technical support and other services around open source software. And Lumen wants to be like that. Lumen is a for-profit, not because I think there's a chance to get rich trying to give stuff away for free. Lumen's a for-profit because as a nonprofit, we would only have access to grants, but we wouldn't have access to investment. As a for-profit, we have access to both sources of funding. <coughs> and it signals you know, to folks that we're not just kind of starting a nonprofit and not thinking at all about sustainability and where we're gonna be in 18 months. We are really serious about being around for a long time. And as, as Dave said yesterday morning about OpenStax, you know, that people ask, well, what's the catch? There's no catch. You can download our platform, you can take the courses, you can run them yourself and never talk to us, and that's awesome, great. OER got adopted and we didn't have to show up. Awesome. If you don't have the technical capability on your campus, if you don't have the instructional designers, if you don't have folks that can run open source software, if you need some help, we will show up. And we'll do small engagements, like the one, you know, I was here a couple years ago, I spent a day, a day and a half with Eddie. Where'd you go, Eddie? I don't want to state, I don't want to overstate, so you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the biology work here grew out of that visit and some talks and conversations we had while I was here. Is that fair to say? 
um, you know, pretty small engagement, day and a half. We do bigger things like the work at Tidewater that Lauren mentioned during the introduction. You know, this is a complete degree program, and I'll say some more about this in a few minutes. This is a complete degree program where we've replaced textbooks in every required course and in a sufficient number of elective courses that you can graduate without ever buying a textbook. If you pay attention to which sections of the courses you're signing up for, you can do a 100% OER-based program, and it makes it literally a third cheaper to graduate. It's 33% cheaper to graduate from that as of fall 13 than it was in fall 12. And of course, the fact that everything is open keeps us honest, if you will, in terms of you know, the way we price things and the way we work with institutions. Uh, a typical engagement for us is a $5 per enrollment kind of uh, engagement, and that's, you're replacing your $150 or $200 textbook with that. Now, when you talk about things, so that's all I'm, that's everything I'm going to say about Lumen. When you talk about things that are free, you normally will get some grumpy cats. <laughs> and you've probably heard this as you've talked to, as you've talked to folks about OER. There's a very clear sense that you get what you pay for, and things that are free must, uh, by some natural law, be poor quality. Because if they're good quality, they'd be expensive. Uh, you know, about 2006, I got so sick of hearing this that I redirected my entire research group, all of our focus, over into arguing with Grumpy Cat here. And, um, and I want to share the results of some of that work with you now. So, Project Kaleidoscope was a uh, NGLC-funded project, the Next Gen Learning Challenges. Um, it was Gates money that was administered by Educause. It was really bizarre. Um, but anyway, Kaleidoscope was a project where we got several institutions together and said, let's, let's look at OER, but let's not look at creating OER. Let's not look at anything with OER other than getting it adopted. Let's all get together and let's agree that we will go out and find OER and aggregate them around a set of learning outcomes and uh, you know, for 10 high enrolling courses across eight partner institutions, we'll pull out uh, some faculty from each institution. So each course like Intro to Psych will have faculty from three different institutions working on Intro to Psych and at least one faculty member at every institution agrees to adopt this Intro to Psych replacement that we'll create. Um, so that was originally an eight community college grant. The, the follow-on grant we received for that moved it up to 28. Um, and we've just wrapped up um, some analysis of the, some of the early data for this. So this particular study, you know, it's not huge, but it's not small either. It's, it's 15, 16,000 students, you know, 130 teachers across eight institutions. And you know, it's not, of course, it's not a true randomized controlled trial because you can't walk in and tell these faculty members that they'll adopt open and these that they won't and, and we'll go on. So this is a quasi-experimental design, but we did use propensity score matching to, you know, to try to mimic randomized assignment. I'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see here kind of the study variables are completion, uh, see or better, credits enrolled this term and credits enrolled next term with a, a poor set of covariates because getting common data across eight set of institutions is actually pretty hard, but three covariates anyway. If you're familiar with propensity score matching, propensity score matching is a, essentially a way of, like I said, uh, kind of mimicking, it's kind of poor man's uh, randomized assignment, right? So you can see on the left, a propensity score basically is a way of collapsing a set of covariates into a, a single score between zero and one that would predict whether the, a person was in the control group or in the treatment group. And maybe the easiest way to think about it is, you know, with the, the graph on the left here, maybe the control group was 80% women and the treatment group was 80% men. And so if we went in to uh, that, compared that control group with that treatment group, we might think we're asking a question about open textbooks, but it would turn out we're actually asking a, a question about boys versus girls. Propensity score matching is a technique that you can use to sample out of a larger control group and pull out a subsample that actually matches your treatment group across all the demography that you have. And so, you know, this is a technique that we frequently use to try to make sure we're getting an apples to apples comparison. And the question we're asking is really a question about open textbooks and not a question about race or about gender or about age, something like that. 
you know, so we, this hasn't appeared yet. It's been submitted to computers and education, but this is some pretty remarkable stuff, I would argue, across eight institutions and, and all these students, that for students who are using open textbooks, let me say that a different way, for students whose faculty assigned open textbooks instead of commercial textbooks, more students completed those classes. And not only did more students complete classes, but even though some who might have dropped otherwise stayed in the class, simultaneously, more students finished the course with a C or better. So we kept people in who would have dropped. And even with those people still in the class, we raised the percentage of students who completed with a C or better. And to some of the data, you know, Cable uh, showed a really nice looking slide last night, if I may say so myself with data from the Florida Virtual Campus Survey, where students say, students self-reported that they take fewer classes because of the cost of textbooks. Um, and we found that to the tune of almost two full credits, that students whose faculty members assigned them open educational resources instead of commercial textbooks took more credits in the term that they were assigned, and they took more credits in the next term as well. Um, yeah, a slightly better example in terms of research design is, it, the design is pretty similar, but way more covariates and, and certainly a, a better outcome variable in this study, which is a high school study uh, out of Utah, where we supported a district-wide substitution of uh, open textbooks for commercial textbooks. Again, so in a smaller group, um, fewer teachers, but way better set of covariates here, right? All of the data are coming from one district. We had, I think we started out with 18 covariates in the study. So not just age, gender, and race, but whether students were special ed designated, ELL students, how they had performed on the 2011 state standardized test for science, what their GPA had been back there, you know, a teacher quality proxy variable that was the average uh, test score on last year's science exam in that teacher's classroom. And basically what we looked at was student score on this year's state standardized test in their science area you know, using open textbooks. And what we found, again, uh, this was just published in, in October in Ed Researcher, was that the IRT scaled scores for students that used open textbooks were statistically significantly higher than you know, the same teachers in the same building teaching the same subject in years before. Um, when they were using commercial textbooks. Another example, this is a project that Lumen supported, but we didn't do the research on. This was done internally by folks at Mercy, uh, looking at their developmental math. And if you know about developmental math, it, you know, these, this is math 098, 099, the kind of math you take when you don't quite qualify to take the one college algebra class you need to graduate. Josh Jarrett, it used to be at the Gates Foundation, called this the course where dreams go to die. Right? If you can't get into college algebra coming out of high school, if you end up in developmental math, you know what percentage of people nationally pass this class? About 40, 45% of people pass it. If you end up in here, the odds are you're not going to graduate from college. So you know, this is a multi-year engagement. Mercy was a kaleidoscope partner. Um, you know, they, they're actually doing pretty well. They had almost 50% you know, almost passing. Uh, in the spring of 2011 when the last time that they taught without any OER. In the spring of 2012, they, uh, they and I'm doing spring versus spring instead of fall to spring because there's actually, this is an even better story than spring to fall because in fall you get everybody in the course who tests in. In spring you only have the people who tested in in fall and failed in fall and came back again in spring. Um, you know, so they're doing no sections using OER in spring of 2011. They ran a pilot of six sections uh, you know, during the 12-13 year, and then it went so well they just said, forget it, we're switching every section that we teach of, of these courses over to OER in the spring of 13. And you can see what the difference was in the C or better rates here. But together with the C or better rates, I mean, so you know, this is moving from a Pearson bundle that was 170-ish dollars if you bought it from the bookstore, um, you know, to work that where Lumen was 
working with them, providing the hosting for the open source practice system that generates homework problems that students work with that uh, you know, gives them automatic feedback. These numbers really bothered me. You know, those numbers plus those numbers together are just really annoying. And I thought, I thought we should do something with that. And this, this might not be what we should have done with it, but this is what we did with it. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to step back for a second and say, you know, for all the money we ask students to spend on materials, maybe we should ask ourselves what they get out of it. And, you know, for lack of four other words that rhymed, uh, you know, here's what we came up with. Um, if you think about the percentage of students that are going to finish the course with a C or better from zero to 100, and in the case of this particular graph, cost of textbooks ranging from zero to 200, um, this is, yeah, here we go, lasers, baby. If I don't pay very much, but I don't learn very much, I mean, I suppose, well, that, that's kind of sad. I didn't pay a lot, but I didn't learn a lot. You know, what did I expect? If I pay a lot, but I learn a lot, I'm, you know, I feel like I got what I paid for. That's kind of what I expected, so I feel good about that. If I, you know, if I pay a lot, but I only learn a little, that makes me angry. And if somehow I could pay very little but learn a lot, that would be awesome. You know, so you take these data that I just showed you out of the Mercy College example from the Educause Review article, and you've got a 48% pass rate at $170 and a 60% pass rate at $5. That's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I won't belabor this point. Cable made it yesterday in some conversations. But this is largely public funding that's being spent on these materials, either through Pell Grants or through you know, federally subsidized, staff, subsidized Stafford loans or state grants. This is public funding that's going to these materials. I mean, I don't know what we would call it, but we'd probably call it something like gross negligence if we bid out a bridge project or a road project. And what we found out later was that for 3,500% higher cost, we got 20% worse quality. Somebody would go to jail if that happened on a road project. And that's what's happening all the time with our instructional materials choices. Um, one last example here. We talked about the Z degree, the Tidewater uh, Z degree, which you know, is an all OER degree around 30%, 33% cheaper for students to graduate from. You know, the question was asked yesterday, it came up a couple of times, you know, what do you tell your bookstore when your bookstore says to you, oh my gosh, we're gonna lose so much money if you do this OER thing. Um, so here's a different way of looking at some outcome data when you do a large scale OER adoption. Let's talk about this idea of completion. You know, if the student drops, it's bad for the student. We've been talking about student outcomes for a minute. Let's talk about the institution, though. When the student drops before the ad drop deadline, what do you do with their tuition money? You give it back to them, right? Because they managed to drop before the deadline. Um, you know, we, this, uh, we just submitted this to Ed Policy Analysis Archive. Um, you know, the Z sections are the zero textbook cost section. That's what they call them there. These are the OER sections. These are non-OER sections. It doesn't look like it's that big a difference in the drop rate between these two sections, but it turns out that when they come out of pilot mode and they switch all their, you know, when all the enrollments in these courses move over to OER, you're looking about a 182 students per year that won't drop these courses or that may not drop these courses that would have otherwise. So you say 182 students, 89% of them are in state, in state, they pay $164 a credit for a three credit course. And remember, in community college, there is no, once you get to 12 credits, everything else is all you can eat buffet. They pay per credit all the way, same price. 182 students, 11 of whom would have been out of state, paying that much per credit for a three credit class. You're looking at about you know, $300,000 per year they would have refunded in tuition that they might not refund in the future. Uh, intro stands for increased tuition revenue through open uh, model. So, you know, there's good things for the student, there's good things for the institution. How about for faculty when you adopt OER? 
Um, I'm really fascinated by this idea of what can I do in my classroom when I can assume that things are open that I couldn't do when I couldn't assume that things are open. You know, what becomes possible? Um, and it's interesting, you, you, ask, you ask an educator this question, what could you do in your classroom if you didn't have to worry about copyright at all? Like if you just had a waiver that said you no longer have to obey copyright, what could you do? Turns out it's a really hard question. It's like asking a, a structural engineer, like, what could you do if there was no longer gravity? <laughs> or like asking a researcher, what, if I gave you infinite money, what could you do? People just, they just don't even know how to respond. It, it turns out to be a pretty hard question. Oh, here in my notes. Or if you asked a politician, if you no longer had to worry about keeping your party happy, what could you do? You know, as an educator, what could you do if you didn't have to worry about copyright, if you were unrestrained? Which you can be if you choose OER. What can you do? Well, the, the, the first thing you can do is you can get rid of what I call disposable assignments, right? Disposable assignments are assignments that students hate to do. They add literally no value to the world. You hate grading them more than they hate doing them, although they don't know that. And then when you give it back to them, without even looking at what you wrote, they just immediately throw it in the garbage. It's, it's a net loss in value and energy for the entire universe. Um, and yet a lot of our assignments work that way. But there are interesting things you can do when you choose open educational resources instead of commercial materials. So this is, uh, the URL for this is pm4id.org. Um, this is a, I used to teach project management when I was full time at BYU. I'm an adjunct now. Um, there is no project management textbook for instructional designers, as you might imagine. It's kind of too niche a market to the question yesterday, what do we do about niche textbooks? And you know, I, even though this is an embarrassing story for me, I'll tell it all myself. I was complaining to a colleague saying, oh, you know, I really wanted to use an open textbook for this course. I found this open textbook on project management that was so close to what I needed. It was written for the business school, though. All the examples were like, you have to get 30 million tons of concrete and 10 million tons of rebar to China at the same time, and they're coming from here, and from like these logistics examples that nobody in my class was gonna care about. It was so close. And my colleague basically backhanded me and said, it's open, moron. You know, <laughs> make it be what you want it to be. Gosh, you're right, you know. So I started looking at the amount of work it was going to take to do that, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know. This is this whole textbook, and all throughout it, there's these little yellow boxes that have the examples in them, and the examples are all wrong, and there's these, the assessments, and the assessments are all wrong. I thought, this is going to be like writing a textbook from scratch. I am way too lazy to do this. There's no way it's going to happen. And then, you know, inspiration. Like clouds parted and sunlight came down and uh, you know, get the students involved in the work. So the first time I taught this class with an open textbook, the assignments that the students were engaged in were assignments to clean up the textbook. In fact, in a project management class, we created a project which was managed by the students, and their project was to improve the project management book. So they broke off into groups, and based on the skills they had and what they were interested in or skills they wanted to develop, they took on different parts of the book. So there's a group in that first year that went through and rewrote all the yellow boxes. And when you think about the kinds of essays or the kinds of multiple choice questions or something you might give students to find out if they understand content or not, instead ask them to write meaningful examples in their discipline in a textbook and you will find out that it's actually a way better measure of their learning and they care way more about doing it because they know that next semester somebody's going to come along and use what they just wrote as their official textbook that they're going to learn from in the course. They put in more effort on the work. You put in more effort because you're not grading something they're going to throw away now. You're editing something that a future set of students is going to use. They know it has value. You know it has value. Everybody engages in it in a different way. Um, another set of students went through and found three different people who work full time as managers of instructional design projects, and they shot video cases with each of them. So in each chapter now, in the first page of each of these chapters, there are three video case studies where each one, each person talks about the topic uh, in response to some prompts from that group of students. 
Another group of students went through and aligned this book with the PMBOK, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, which is the, the canonical reference on project management if you want to earn the project management certification. Now, when I tell students that if you earn the PMP certificate, the average, the average salary for people with a PMP certificate is $106,000 a year, then all of my students are interested in a project management certificate. So one group of students went through and took the content in this book and moved it around and realigned it. And so now at the top of every chapter, it tells you this chapter includes the following topics covered in the PMBOK that are tested with these percentages on the certification exam. And here's how you use this chapter to prepare for the certification exam. Because the books that you buy to prepare for the certification exam are $200, $250. They, they, they made multiple, and I've taught this you know, course a couple of times. And this is what I did every term. The students made a number of changes to the book, a number of improvements to the book. It actually got to the point where when I taught the course, I would just say on the first day of class, there's good news and bad news. The good news is you all just received an A. Thank you for coming to class today. You all have an A. Now, the bad news is I'm going to work you like a dog. And you're going to work even harder in this class than you will in any other, even though I just told you it's the first day of class and you've, you've got an A. You're done grade-wise, forget about it. Now, you're playing for pride because you're going to stand up in front of class every day and your group is going to show to the rest of the class in our project update meetings where you are in your work. And at the end of the day, your name is going to go on this book as a co-author with some attribution, the way Creative Commons licenses require, and you don't want to embarrass yourself professionally. Everybody clear? And beautiful. It just, they love it. They kill themselves in this class. I kill myself in that class. And now, you know, I've got a list of schools that are also using this textbook that as my students are coming out of their program, they're co-authors on a textbook that's being used by other programs around the country. Um, I, I haven't put the URL, URL up for this one because it's not going to be released until Monday. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll blog about it on Monday so you can find the link there. Uh, as an adjunct now, I only teach a class a year because I'm spending my full time with Lumen. But the course I teach is an introduction to open education. And you know, there's no reader for this class that kind of collects the important articles that every student ought to read. And as I thought about that, I thought, yeah, how could we, you know, how could we uh, do the same thing that we did in the project management class in this context, slightly different context. I don't want them editing you know, the Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. I want them to read that exactly the way he wrote it. Um, what could we do? And so I spent some time brainstorming with the students. And we talked about it. And what we came up with was this idea of a reader um, where the students would go through and as a group, you know, well, not as a group, first individually. Every student took a set of structured notes on every reading. They talked about the background, key points, summaries, you know, what was historically significant about it, what would be the most interesting questions to ask yourself and to discuss as you read this article, what are additional related articles, things like that. So every student created these kinds of notes for each article that we read. And then about you know, three quarters of the way through the term, we stopped reading. And every student in the class took ownership for a certain number of articles. And then that student got all the student notes from that article and was responsible to synthesize them all into a small piece, no more than two pages long, that could go into this book, into the reader. And so what we have now is about 135 pages of new student material that provides the background and a summary of key points and a set of discussion questions around what I think are the key things that somebody wants to know about open education should read. And same deal. They kill themselves. They knew they were going to be trading notes with each other. They knew they'd be totally embarrassed if their notes were awful. Um, and they knew that they were going to be co-authors on a book that came out at the end of the course. The, the last example I'll give is an admittedly weird one, but it, it really drives home a point I want to make about openness. And that is that for all the things that openness does, and remember, when I say open, I don't mean free. I mean free plus permissions. What the permissions do, um, probably my favorite, my favorite phrase about open is that openness facilitates the unexpected. It lets all kinds of awesome things happen that you could never have imagined would happen. And if the only things that can happen are the things that you explicitly permit to happen, not many awesome things are going to happen. The awesomest things that happen are generally the things you didn't anticipate. 
So this was a course I taught, yeah, what, 2005, 2006. It's a graduate seminar on learning objects. Anybody remember learning objects? Yeah, a couple. Um, and I realized, you know, over the summer as I was preparing to teach this in the fall, I realized what I really wanted the course experience for students to be was I wanted to get a group of people around a conference table, a very specific group of people, like I wanted a software engineer, I wanted a, a, a vice president of sales from uh, you know, a publisher, I wanted a researcher, I wanted an open source zealot who just hated everything that had to do with anything that wasn't open. I wanted this group of people around the table and I just wanted to give them a topic and have them argue about the topic and I wanted the students to sit around the outside and hear all those perspectives. And I knew there was no way I could make that happen. So I had the terrible idea over the summer that I could write it like as a sitcom. Like I could just write those conversations, the conversations I wanted to see happen I can just write them. You know, so here's an example. Uh, R is Rita the researcher. O is like Olaf the open source zealot or something. And D is Dan the developer. You can, you can see them here. V is Vinny the vice president or something. So I wrote, you know, this set of 30 some uh, conversations amongst this group of people. And I threw it in a wiki and put an open license on it because I thought at the speed I'm writing this, I'm sure I'm misspelling half of what I'm writing and the punctuation is going to be terrible. If I throw it in a wiki, the students can help me clean it up as we go. Well, that is not, in fact, what the students did. Um, about the, I don't know, the, the end of the second week, beginning of the third week of this class, as I came in and was rereading what I had written over the summer to be ready to talk with them about it, there was a new character in my sitcom. <laughs> and one of the students had felt like there was a really important K-12 perspective that needed to be shared, and I didn't have a K-12 person in my cast. So she hit the edit tab at the top and introduced T, Tina the teacher, and started writing Tina into my sitcom. And, you know, Tina didn't show up for every conversation that this group of people had, but when there was an important K-12 perspective, somebody, and it wasn't always even the same person, hit the edit tab and wrote Tina in. And this is when it really first struck home to me that by being open, you give people opportunity to do interesting and useful things. You give them permission. And they're willing and they want to do interesting things if you'll just allow them to. Um, you know, by way of closing, I think you all know this quote from Newton about standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, if, if I haven't made the point yet about open and what it is that I think that's powerful about open as opposed to a traditional copyright, in the context of this quote, I think the right analogy is that traditional copyright is like spiked shoulder pads. Right? I'm going to make it hard for you to stand on my shoulders. I'm going to make it painful for you to stand on my shoulders. I don't want you on my shoulders. Whereas open licenses are like bringing you a ladder, saying, here, let me help you up onto my shoulders. I want you to get up there and see further than I've seen. So, Tying back to the title by way of being maybe slightly provocative, <coughs> affordable is certainly better than expensive. Absolutely. But if affordable is better than expensive, I think it's probably true that free is even better than affordable. <coughs> and if free is better than affordable, open is certainly better than free. You may have heard me say once or twice during the talk that open is free plus permission. And what that really gets you is you know, open gets you permissionless innovation. It gets you improved learning outcomes per dollar. It gets you this kind of anti-rivalrous serendipity. Good things coming back to you that you never even expected. So my challenge to you would be, you know, don't settle for affordable when you could have It's on.
Um, first of all, that was great. Um, Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you added Tina, the teacher, the K-12 perspective the, later the on. The students added. The Tina. students added, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, what, would you, what would you say that the student's role is in the advocacy of this movement around open educational resources? And I'm not just talking about the college student, I'm also talking about the high school students and their parents on the way to college. Yeah, I, I think the student's role, well, okay, first of all, I'm just gonna admit that there's an expert on student advocacy sitting over here who you should really afterwards, Nicole, raise her hand. You should ask Nicole this question afterwards. She can actually answer the question for you. Um, I, I would say that the student's role is really an awareness raising role. It's helping either their high school teacher or their faculty member understand that when they're in their learning management system teaching with their course pack that they're driving an airplane down the highway help and helping them see that there's so much more possible if they would just make a different choice. Most faculty just, they don't know. It's not that faculty are lazy, although that's occasionally true. It's not that faculty are dumb or ill-intentioned. or I mean, you can always find one or two bad examples, but as a group, you know, we didn't get into education because we want to be rich or because we dreamed of fame or what we got in because we want to help people learn. And if, if somebody can help me understand a way to do it better, then that's great. I, I want to be better. I, I genuinely do. And I think most faculty feel that way. Um, but they're probably not going to hear this particular message at their professional association's annual event or someplace else. The place they're likely to hear it is from a student who walks into office hours and says to them in a private setting where they're not calling them out in public and embarrassing them, did you know about, you know, let me show you something. Um, you know, the, the other side of the student role here, when you do have pilots happening on your campus where you have a couple of faculty members that have made a displacing adoption choice with OER, is, um, is actually putting some quote unquote market pressure on faculty. This is, um, so at Salt Lake Community College where we are doing, we have a big math pilot going on. Uh, I had a call the, the first semester about the second or third day of term, not a call, I had an email from the um, department head of the math department there saying, I've got a line of students outside my door wanting to know why their section of Math 1010 is $180 better than their roommate's section of Math 1010. <laughs> and what you'll see starts to happen is students will enroll. I mean, when you go in and you look, there's five sections and two of them have zero textbook costs and the other have a $180 bundle, then the free ones fill up, the expensive ones languish, the faculty member starts to scratch their head like, what is going on? And you know, when other, course, when other sections have a wait list and you can't fill yours, if that goes on for too long, like your tenure and promotion committee wants to know what's happening. And you know, we, Cable mentioned last night in terms of policy, the best thing that the institution can do to support OER is to make a positive statement about it in the TMP guidelines. Right. Uh, but students can actually work TMP from the bottom as they choose to enroll in sections where OER adoptions are happening. I mean, students do that for their own self-interested reasons anyway, but it does end up having this other benefit of conversations happening like, why is your class full and mine won't fill and you've got a wait list, just tell them that I'm, it's like, no, it's not about time of day, it's not about your, you know, rate my professor, like, do you have a chili pepper or not? That's not what it's about. <laughs> it's about textbook cost, yeah. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Following up on the point you just made, you gave data where you compared a course taught OER versus non-OER, and certainly I understand why retention may be higher, costs less, so that's mm -hmm. perfectly understandable. But you also presented data where student performance was better, so what is your explanation for that? Yeah, it has nothing to do with instructional design. I, I would argue, at least, in, and somebody else might make a different argument. Um, in our study, the, this is very, these are very baby steps sort of studies, right? So by baby steps, I mean the faculty member that's making the displacing adoption 
is adopting materials that look very much like the materials they used to use and using them in a way that's very similar to the way they used to use their old materials. This isn't huge pedagogical innovation that's hard to get people to buy into. What's the smallest possible delta between where you are and OER that we can help you kind of start walking down? So the, the difference, m most of that kind of research that you'll read, this kind of horse race research, is my approach better than yours, always has some kind of pedagogical or instructional design kind of underpinning. I'm a constructivist and you're an objectivist and I'm gonna show you that my way of teaching is better. And that's not what this is about. This is about when I come into class on the first day and um, I don't, oh, so I don't know if I mentioned that the kaleidoscope schools were either all community colleges or open access four-year schools. And that's really who we focus on, if, um, who Lumen focuses on in our work. If you can get into MIT or Stanford, uh, you know, I don't worry about your academic success. If you're at Shadron State in the middle of Nebraska, I think you might need a little extra help, possibly. Um, and when those students come through the door, they're not flush with cash ready to buy the textbook on the first day. Um, many of them are waiting for financial aid to come. Financial aid check might come sometime late the third week, early the fourth week of class. So particularly like you saw the, the most extreme examples in developmental math, right, where there was like a, what was it, a 12% 12, 12 increase in the pass rate. You're in developmental math because you're behind at math. When you come in behind, what we're gonna do then is assign you a book that's so expensive that you can't get it, and an online practice system so expensive that you can't start practicing until your financial aid check comes. When your financial aid check comes three weeks later, now not only are you behind from where you are behind before, now you're three weeks behind in the class as well. And now you finally get access if you spend your financial aid money on that. A lot of students two and a half weeks in at the ad drop date which somehow comes before your financial aid check comes, look at that and say, I, you know, I just can't do it. And so they'll drop because they're so far behind in a class that they are in because they were behind already. You compound that with the cost of textbook. So you know, that's the most stark example, but I think across all the, you know, the, uh, the 50 courses in the kaleidos kaleidoscope example as well, when every single student has access to all the materials that they need for on the very first day of class, and not in a little one week trial period something, but when they actually own everything that they need on the very first day, they're just gonna do better. I mean, if we wanted to run an, an RCT to answer this question, do students with the materials they need do better than students that don't, and we assigned half of you to be in a class where we were gonna grade you and put it on your transcript and forbade you to have instructional materials, like IRB would never even approve that, it's unethical. But, but that's what's happening. Um, so I don't think it's about improved instructional design, although there's certainly opportunity for that. It's not about open pedagogy practices like rejecting disposable assignments, although that's certainly possible. These kinds of studies are smallest possible delta studies of use materials that look like the materials you used to use and use them in the same way you used to use them. Just give every single student a copy that they own on the very first day. And just that one thing makes that much difference. Now imagine what will happen when you start doing these open pedagogy kinds of things where you change the nature of your assessment in the classroom and you start doing some other experiments. There's so much headroom, 48% pass rate. The headroom for improvement there is crazy. Another question over here. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question, if in your experience, have you found areas that seem to be more difficult to push in the, in the direction of OER. So I'll give you an example. It seems to me it's easy to construct a math problem and, and uh, put it out, okay? But if you're creating a course in art history or music, then I see the tethers to the road to be much more stronger. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you bridge that, especially, I mean, you know, just say the word copyright and, you know, like, start cringing at times. Uh, so I'd just like to know about your experience doing Yeah, doing yeah. That. Well, I mean, the, the thing that you come to understand very quickly is that in the non-humanities disciplines, what we're studying a lot of times are ideas. 
But in the humanities disciplines, a lot of times what we're studying are artifacts. And there is no, you know, while a major publisher might have a physics textbook and OpenStax might have an equivalent open textbook that's open source, there is no open source equivalent of the Mona Lisa. Right? I mean, there's an artifact, it's worthy of study, we study that artifact. Right? So you can't swap out open source replacements for the artifacts that you wanna, that you wanna study in humanity, so that makes it really hard. Um, you know, the, the music history course, I can't even tell you where it is. The music history course that we're doing now with a number of schools has a very small amount of open source you know, recordings that are CC licensed in it, but ends up depending a lot on Spotify. I'm telling students to go get a free Spotify account and here's the playlist I built in Spotify and listen to those songs. They're free but not open. But that's literally as close as you can come to doing an OER class in music history. If you want students to listen to those recordings. Like if, if you have to listen to the Ave, to the Mozart, you know, to the Ave Verum Corpus, either you find an open version of it or you don't. There's, there's no open source knockoff version of Ave Verum Corpus written by Mozart spelled backwards or something, right? <laughs> they have to listen to that song. So either you find an open recording or you find a YouTube video that's not open where somebody's performing it live and has posted it legally or you send them off to Spotify or someplace like that. In art history, you know, it's the Google Art Project with really, really high quality digital scans of important art. Not, maybe not all the art that you want and certainly not openly licensed, but at least free. Um, you know, so in some of those cases, you, you do the best that you can. Um, but humanities is really tricky to do a fully 100% OER course. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> A related question. Um, I teach American literature, so I'm able to give them the stuff up until about 1920. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions for? I mean, these aren't these aren't publishers making massive amounts of money. This is Toni Morrison and Sherman Alexie, and this is how they make their livelihoods. So, I don't know what's the right answer to how do I get, how do I teach that affordably? Yeah. Um. Um. It's it's a good question. Of course. Um, a lot of it has to do with partnerships with your library, probably. Um, you know, what, one question that is often asked that wasn't, wasn't asked today is what about all these library resources that our students are helping pay for that aren't open but that they have free access to? Like, should we not use them just because they're free but not open? <laughs> You know, so, so you, you can rely on your library there. But again, this, you know, literature is another one of these places where there's, there's no open source knockoff of To Kill a Mockingbird, right? Like, I mean, either you read it and talk about it or you don't. Um, so some, it, it really does raise a bunch of interesting questions that you might not have another reason to think about, about differences between disciplines um, and the nature of what we study in the discipline. But, you know, other than making, you know, choosing things that are available in a trade paperback format so they can pick them up for five or seven dollars a piece or using things that they already have paid for because the library has it in the <coughs> holdings. Um, you know, again, there's not, there's not a terrific answer. It's a you do the best you can. Um, but I think you'll find that if you go in and you talk to your librarian about the situation you're in and what you want to do and what they do have in collections and what they could have in the collection, you can actually make some really meaningful progress on, on that problem. Uh, I'd like to also share that one of the things we're doing with Affordable Learning Georgia in collaborating with our university presses and with our libraries and through our textbook transformation grants is looking at how can we provide clearance models that are affordable. Um, there's some strategies that we're able to explore through the resources already in existence in the university system that we can um, through our partnerships with ECOR, through focusing on the um, top 50 lower division courses, take advantage of those resources to provide for the university system uh, some cleared anthology type resources for the literature. And we'll also be looking at the um, appreciation courses in collaboration with ECOR. Uh, so those aren't easy questions to answer. And um, we are hoping with your help and the resources that we have in our 
powerful system to um, help answer those for the group if we can't all answer them individually. And I'd like to um, thank Dr. Wiley for his really interesting talk this morning. I think uh, I see a lot of heads nodding around the room. Uh, I feel like nodding like like nodding off. <laughs> Dr. Wiley, Just you are a professor. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen it before. 